Hey, welcome back everyone to this special CUBE conversation. I'm John Furrier here in theCUBE's Palo Alto Studios. My next guest is Dr. Tom Bradish, friend of theCUBE, works at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, heads up the IoT, general manager and vice president of servers, converged edge IoT systems. But we're here, here to talk about uh, not so much, not HPE, but really the work that Tom's done in, 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 a, in a topic called First Mover, a book that he's writing, it hasn't come out yet, so we're going to get an early preview of what it's like to create a category, innovation, and how to use process to your advantage, not make it your enemy, how to use creativity, and how to motivate people, and how to sell it through organizations, whether it's venture capitalists or managers. Tom, you got great experience, thanks for spending time to come into the studio. It's great to be here, thanks for having me and I'm happy to have this discussion. If you go back to the CUBE videos, if there are folks watching that know you, have seen all the videos at HPE Discover, HP Discover back in the day, you had a great career. You, you were an, an engineer, built the first notebook computer with IBM. You've done a lot of groundbreaking things and, and, and I like the topic of your book, First Mover, because it speaks to your mindset. Um, entrepreneurial, innovative, breaking through walls, <laughs> get stuff, you probably got a lot of scar tissue, so I want to, I want to, uh, Talk about that because this is what the opportunity many entrepreneurs have. As you know in theCUBE, we really believe that a renaissance in software development's coming. It's so obvious, open source is, is growing at an extraordinary pace. Um, reuse of code, right. you got uh, IOT, area you're involved in. You got you know, cryptocurrency, blockchain, all these new waves are coming all at yes, once. Yes, and so, yeah, yeah. You know, I wish I was 22 again um, <laughs> because it's a great opportunity to innovate. But there's some proven things. What are, what are some of those things? Let's, let's jump in. What do you see as the, the playbook? What have you learned and what can you share? Well, sure, I've, uh, I've been blessed. I've had a, a career where I've been able to do a lot of innovation. But also I like to uh, uh, separate the notion of innovation from differentiation. And see, it's possible to be innovated and not different. Like it's possible for you and I to have the same new suit. It's new, it's innovative, but it's not different. And differentiation is really where one can have a first mover advantage because differentiation by definition is new, is innovation, but it's not always the other way around. So I always tell my teams and I always focus on how can we be two things, both different and better. It's possible also to be different and not as good. You could have the highest failure rate in the industry, you're different, but that's not good, right? <laughs> yeah. So the concept here is how do you be different, not just new and innovative, but how do you be different and how do you be you know, good? And I've actually faced three risks in uh, mostly the big corporate culture that we've had to innovation. And the first risk is, of course, the obvious one that people say, will customers buy it? That's called market risk. Is it something that's good enough to be purchased at a profit? The second risk is, can it be manufactured at quality and at a rate of consumption? And then the third risk is your own company. Does the company have what it takes actually to take on the risk of a brand new product category? Not just a new product, but a new category of products that by definition have never been done before. And when one can do that, when one can figure that out, and I've had um, some significant experience with this, uh, you can catapult your careers, you can catapult your company and your customers to new levels because you enjoy the benefits of the first mover. And that's the name of the book, The First Mover. Well, I'm yeah. looking forward to seeing it. But I want to, I'm going to ask, this is super important because a lot of people, um, they're really good at something and they run hard, they break through a wall, mm -hmm. but might have missed something. So you, you kind of bring up this holistic picture. Um, what, it, what are some of the things that folks should focus in on? Say, say I have a breakthrough idea, I got a prototype up and running, it's in market, I think it's the best thing since sliced bread, I'm pushing it hard, um, people are just going to lap this up, this is going to be great. I know it's yeah. innovative, but no one else knows it. Right, right. What yeah. do I do? What's the process? What do you recommend? Well, what I like to do is portion the benefits into two categories. There are supply side benefits, that's to your company, right? Why is this good for your company to do this? And then there are demand side benefits, meaning why is it good for the customer? Most people tend to focus mostly on the demand side. Oh, it solves this problem and the customers will love it. And that's important. And I would call that a necessary but not sufficient condition. The other condition is why is this good for your company? And many times when it's a brand new product category, those inside a company aren't quite in tune with why it's good for the customer. Because again, it's a new thing, it's a new product category. Uh, why is an automobile better than a horse and buggy, right? Why is a laptop computer better than a desktop computer? These are the ideas where it may be intuitive, it may be um, instructive to talk about that, but when you can get a business model first and start with that, well the reason is we can enjoy this margin. The reason is we can enjoy this particular first mover advantage, the halo effect, the, the, the uh, reputation of being the leader. The reason is because we can penetrate a new market. The reason is we can now overcome uh, falling revenue in a shrinking TAM. Now we can 
accelerate in another TAM perhaps as well. So by coming up with both the demand mm. side and the supply side, you have a better case to go forward for the support and funding inside a big corporation. There's always product market fit. I hear the buzzwords, oh, I got to get the cash flow positive break even. There's yeah. always a f motivating force to get something done. Um, how should someone organize the order of their operations to get something done to the market? If it's an innovative, groundbreaking, differentiating, because a lot of the big challenges, some people call land and expand, I heard that mm -hmm. buzzword too, but mm -hmm. you get a champion inside a company, and that champion embraces it, and most people think, oh man, I got that, I got a customer. Yeah, but then right. that person has to sell it through and then it has right. to be right. operationalized, meaning yes. people got to get used to it. These are real challenges. They are. What, yes. is the, what is your view of how an entrepreneur or a business executive or practitioner to get through that? Well, you have to get people on your side, and it's really important. Somebody's got to believe in either you, not even understanding what you're proposing, but they'd say, well, you have a track record, for some reason I believe what you're saying. And then secondly, getting customers. So I have personally never done anything major without a customer that I call an inspiration customer. That's a name I've just made up. So a customer, by the way, by definition, is an end user that will buy something from you. That's the definition of a customer. And an inspiration customer is one that will help you that is okay with seeing your dirty laundry, okay with mistakes you might make, because they see the value in it, and they also see the value in them being a first mover. And I like to tell my team, we want to be a first mover and a trendsetter, so our customers can also be trendsetters in their business, mm -hmm. right, as well. So therefore, by getting that customer uh, support, and that's in the form of POCs or in trials or in just you know customer testimony, combine that now with a second dimension called the analyst community, which um, your team you know resides in as well. Also saying, well, I think this is good as well, brings a lot of uh, credibility because there's a um, there's a saying, a verse in the Bible that a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown. Now, if you think about that, <laughs> a lot of times your own company that you reside in has a lower point of view because it's very consumed with indeed what is next and doing the right thing by the way. I have to make uh, this quarter, right? We have to uh, protect the brand. We have to keep the cash flow coming in. These are all important things. So how do you get someone to focus on that? Many times it's not you anymore, it's outside. And I call that the, uh, the second C, right? The first C is internal to the company. Mm -hmm. The second C is your customers and the community that also could include, by the way, um, uh, analysts, uh, the media, other experts, consultants, those type of C's around yeah. there. Now the third C is the competition. This is a little bit controversial. What happens when the idea is now exploited by the competition first? Sometimes that is a motivator for a company to jump on it as well mm -hmm. and make the market. But again, if you follow the competition, you're not the first mover, you don't enjoy the benefits of first mover advantage, higher margin, the halo yeah. effect of being the, the, the innovator is, and also learning, that's an important one. You're a first yeah. mover, you're out there learning so that you can respond to the second generation in a better yeah. way. I like this notion of differentiation and innovation as a, uh, two different variables because yes. it's super important. Yeah. You can be different and not innovative, you can be innovative, not different. Yeah. Again, it's all contextual, but I want to get back to the pioneering of the first mover. So, you know, statistically speaking, a lot of the best entrepreneurs are first movers and are often misunderstood. You hear that all the time. Yes, oh, yeah. Or, you know, have, being a visionary is the difference between being 10 years in the future versus an hour can make the difference between success. We well, are crazy on one end and you're brilliant on the other because the time to yes, value yeah. catches up with, with that profit, if you will. So the question is, is that how does first movers continue to win? Because I've seen situations where first movers come in, get a position mm -hmm. and win, and stay, keep the lead. Mm -hmm. Other times first movers come in, set the market up, create all the attention, and then have arrows on their back. And a second mover enjoys the benefit. Yeah, so yeah. the second mover comes in, bigger scale, so there's competition, competitive strategy overlaid on this, which even complicates it even further. Indeed, <laughs> yes. So yes. your thoughts on, on that? Yes, indeed. Well. One way to look at this is the, the way to, to move forward is again, when you can get some momentum that's not you. That's the number one. Um, as a Market growth, as number a, of subscribers yeah. during the internet, that's yes. a trend, or yes. mobile users. And, and a, th a third party consultant who is highly respected, yeah. you know, agrees or an analyst. And I ran into an analyst recently in a, in a coffee shop who uh, agreed with this, some of this first mover work we're doing in converged edge systems, which is a new class of products mm -hmm. as well. But it's really important that um, you, you can't be discouraged, let me point this out. What I tell my team, and I tell students, I lecture at universities, and I've been an adjunct professor, uh, those younger in their career, 
is if you cast in a vision and you have an idea and nobody gets it, don't be discouraged. That's a good sign. That sounds a little bit, yeah. uh, you know, funny. Why is it a good sign? Because if everybody gets it right away, it's likely not that novel. It's likely rather ordinary. It's likely been thought of before mm -hmm. as well, right? So by the very nature and definition that the average person might think is discouraging, oh, nobody understands me, nobody gets mm -hmm. this idea, should be an encouragement, you know, and a motivation. Yeah. Now the risk here is people not getting it is also a sign of a stupid idea. So usually when people don't get it, it's either really not good, right? Or really, or <laughs> really amazing that yeah. eventually they'll come around to yeah. it. I had a, uh, a boss in one of my uh, career opportunities told me to stop working on a product. I don't want to give too much detail, but he literally told me that. And I said, uh, I don't want to be insubordinate to a boss. We all have them. And I said, you know, can I please just keep working on it? Okay, but don't let it interfere with the other stuff, da, da, da. Today that market is a $9 billion market right, as well. Of that product. Of that, that very product that I was told by, by a very astute person, one of my um, you know, colleagues, my bosses, you know, said, yeah, I don't see the, the yeah. future in this, let's not do this, right, you know, as well. But being able to um, have a second thing. So number one is don't be discouraged by people not getting it. By definition, that's supposed to happen yeah. when you have a new. Uh, good point. Uh, yes, You yes. want to finish, I want oh, to. I just wanted to get, um, get one more thing. If I may, yeah, add a second one. And as you're moving forward with this, right, as well, is uh, seek out and find those who do agree with you and stick with them very, very closely. And I have, I can, I can say a couple of names. Uh, there's one, uh, we've created this new product class called Converge Ed Systems. Alan Andreole is a senior vice president yeah. at HP. Cube alumni. Great. And he's a Cube alumni. Super and I'm smart. pointing him out because he has publicly taken on this idea that this product category can really, really work. Cloud nine. And, and he's worked. Is that Cloud9? Oh, the uh, the converged edge system called EdgeLine. Okay, got it. Okay. The EdgeLine product brand, right? Okay. You know as well. So therefore, you know when you when you have to, you find someone who has um, authority. The eagles fly together. Inside. You want to get a good absolutely. peer group. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So here's the question for you. So um, one of my experiences, and I want to just get your reaction and, and add on to your thoughts, is most entrepreneurs or pioneers um, are misunderstood. So I agree. Don't be discouraged, but also keep validating and the, and be a data seeker. Right? Yes, get yeah. the data. Um, but a lot of times, just getting something in the market or getting it going creates uh, movement and inertia. You get rolling, and sometimes the original idea isn't actually the big idea. It turns into it as you get more data. And you know, the examples like Airbnb wasn't uh, wasn't what it is. It was basically air mattresses and selling cereal. Yes, that yes, was yeah, the original right. story, right? And, and then it turned into, but conceptually, it was the same thing. So you don't have to be a hundred percent right on the semantics. It's well known that, that most startups don't end up being successful with the product they started with. That's well known fact. But that's true also in large companies with a product idea as well. So you have to have this interesting balance. It's very, it's very interesting as I've thought about this and studied. You have to have deep philosophical and conviction of principles. And here's why. If you don't, you will be swayed by everybody's opinion and you'll never get anything done because, oh, well, that's a good idea, maybe I should do this. Well, that's a good idea, maybe I should do this. Now, I'm not saying that's bad to listen to others, but if you don't have a grounding of principles. Example, we established the seven principles of the IoT over two years ago, and we've held on to them and created the success we have based on those principles. And that's not to say we didn't modify them a little bit, but the point is we were convicted with something, and when somebody would come up with a counter to it, we had a way to defend our convictions, if you will, mm -hmm. in internal debates and external debates as well. You know, as well, finding that. And then secondly, you got to be also okay with being the sole inhabitant of that field of discourse. Being a visionary can be a very lonely job because of that, right? And again, it's because you are or, and your team is, it's not always a lone person, yeah. right? The team is actually creating something that literally nobody's ever seen before. Nobody understands before. What process well. is, what, do you wrap around this? Because, you know, uh, Dave Vellante and I always talk about this on, on theCUBE and after theCUBE is that the yeah. you know, process has to be uh, your friend, not your enemy. I mean, it has to work for you. I've Amy always, Jassy I've said also that, yeah. Uh, yeah. says that on, on, as well at Amazon. But also, um, you know, Charlie Munger, uh, Warren Buffett's partner, always says, "I'm not a big pl pl uh, fan of master plans, meaning because you become a slave to the plan rather than the opportunity." Yeah, so, yeah. these are process kind of things, right? Yeah. So, how uh, does an innovator that's a first mover that wants to create a category, because uh, category killers or category creators are huge opportunities financially, they are, they so they are, create yes. a lot of value and wealth and, and opportunity. What process is best? Is there a, a view? Is there is it conditional on certain things? What's your thoughts on, on 
Well, let me say, and I'm going to give you a big, a big company or a medium-sized company context, not a startup. I think they're distinctly different. I've had limited experience with a startup, but I've had significant experience in, in bigger, medium, and large now companies as well. Uh, you can't try to change the system because now you have two variables. You got this new product that nobody's ever heard of, and now you're trying to change the whole system, right? Now again, this is just advice mm -hmm. for, for bigger bigger companies. So be careful how many things you want to change, how many things you want to you know, you'll stop. So you want to take this new thing and align it with existing processes and existing core competencies as much as you can. Even though it's new, it has to have some alignment. I'll give you an example. When we built the Converged Edge Systems, uh, the Edgeline brand, uh, we aligned it with compute. It's not only compute, but we aligned it with compute. Why? Because HPE or HP at the time, right, is number was was and is and now number one in compute when it comes to you know data center um, uh, compute systems when it comes to high performance computing and mission critical, right. So therefore, that was easy to understand. So you're okay, you're familiar with this, but now let me tell you this new twist on it. And I would assume, and I don't know this for sure, but I would assume Steve Jobs and the Apple team that was thinking of this uh, smartphone concept, the iPhone as well, they had to align it with some level of compute capabilities, right? And you notice as it emerged, it also included something that already exists called the iPod, which was already aligned with their um, laptop computers and their desktops, right? Your music would be downloaded as an app to connectivity, but now you can take it with you. And by the way, now I'll add a phone to it. And so this incrementally built, and by the way, you ain't seen nothing yet. I'm going to add a GPS system. I'm going to add a camera your flashlight, your wallet, right, I'm going to add all that in. So by, I think you're incrementally moving with not upsetting the system mm -hmm. in a, like you said, in a large company, uh, really, really helps because you can't change everything uh, too quickly. You got to yeah. be okay being alone. Well, okay I want to interrupt you there for a second yeah. because sure. it's Peter Burris and I talk about all the time. I love his quote, Peter Burris, head of Wikibon Research, says, you know, yeah. the iPhone was a computer that happened to make phone calls. Okay, and that's just smartphones, category creator, and we it know was, what happened, yeah. it, the yeah. rest is history. However, you mentioned talking to customers and having an inspirational customer. I love that concept because you need a muse as, a, as, a, as an innovator. You got to have someone you can trust mm -hmm. that knows what you're trying to do, that understands the mission. If Steve Jobs went into the marketplace and did market research, mm -hmm. he would have probably had the customer feedback to build the best Blackberry, or a, better, a better Blackberry or another device. Instead, he used his gut, was on his mission, and then he understood the inspirational customer, whether it was real or not, he was going down that a different road. That takes guts, but also some discipline. I, I hear you, and I agree with this 100%, 100%. When uh, I had the, uh, the great fortune of leading a team that created the first enterprise blade server or converged system, right. and today that is pushing about a $10 billion you know, market opportunity, and not one customer asked me for it. Now that doesn't mean I didn't listen, okay, but I had to bring it to them. So here's the difference. We're not responding to trends. This is a key point. We're creating a trend. And what I tell my team is you must create trends, not follow them. Many of my competitors are, are by the way, making good money and doing a good business. I'm not, I'm not um, you know, knocking that, but I'm saying they're not creating a trend. They're actually following one. The f they're in an exploding trend. Very lucrative town. trend. Right. Uh, you know, it you can be. Very mature, right. big market. Uh, Dave Thomas with Wendy's <laughs> followed a trend called hamburgers <laughs> and he did pretty well. Right? But he didn't create the hamburger market, yeah. right? But he, he followed one. Now. This is what this is really um, rather interesting. So when you come in and you're saying, "Well, I'm gonna, I'm, I want to actually set a trend and create one," it really gives you this um, this opportunity to uh, to redefine what is happening. So now, quick story. You may have heard this. Maybe your viewers have heard this. Uh, a manager of a, a shoe company sends two guys to an island. It says, "I want you to sell shoes on this island." They get to the island. The first guy calls back and says. Boss, this is terrible. Everybody's bare feet, barefoot. There's no opportunity to sell shoes. This is terrible, I'm coming home. The second guy calls and says, Boss, you're not going to believe this. There's not a shoe on this island, and I have a TAM. That's 100% <laughs> of the market to sell shoes, <laughs> right? I believe, as you pointed out, Steve Jobs didn't go and say, well, what apps do you run on your BlackBerry? Yeah. Uh, he, what he did is he reversed it, and this is what we're doing. We're reversing it. We're saying, yeah. if you could watch a full-length, high-definition movie in your hand, would you? Well, I can, but I can't do it on this device. Yeah. But, but if you could, right? So now, in the IoT, I hear this all the time from my competitors and even some colleagues out in the industry. Well, oh, we ask them what apps they run at the edge. We ask them what they do at the edge. That's good, that's necessary, but not sufficient. You have to say, but if you had this product, wouldn't you, for example, run an entire database? Would you compile your machine learning models at the edge? That's what we do in the cloud now. Wouldn't you do that if you had it? 
well, I never thought of that because I don't have that capability. Just like, well, I never thought of being able to take pictures and watch full length uh, high definition movies because I never had it. But what if you did? What, you know, would you do it? So you've always got to be setting that trend, not responding to it only. That's awesome. Dr. Tom Bradich, writing a book called First Mover, uh, really about process about being innovative. Um, gives you the final word. Thanks for coming in, appreciate sharing the advice. What's going on with HPE and your IoT work? Give a quick, uh, take a minute to talk about what's happening at HPE. Well thanks, pretty exciting. We've been able to uh, move forward with some really great customer wins. I'm hoping to go public with them. Where in many ways, I know this is an abused term, but we're revolutionizing the industrial IoT in particular and manufacturing floors. We have a large uh, auto manufacturer that has uh, chosen Edgeline as the standard to uh, produce uh, more and more vehicles per day. That's their goal. How many more vehicles can I get into my customers' hands per day? We have a snack company making potato chips, uh, looking at what we're doing with uh, software-defining de operations. We have um, even, uh, we've talked about this before, space travel, engage with what the space edge is all about. In many ways, we're potato chips to spaceships. Data centers on Mars. <laughs> and data centers <laughs> everywhere, and then also converging OT, just like the smartphone converged a camera and a right. GPS system. We're converging control systems, data acquisition systems. It's pretty exciting. I've, I've been fortunate to have a company and uh, our, our new CEO, Antonio Neri, has been very supportive. Yeah. I was with him this morning and we talked about that new uh, first of a kind product that we have at this auto manufacturer. So is Antonio going to let us come in and do an exclusive interview since he's been a CUBE alumni multiple times? Yes, I think he <laughs> tell should. Him, tell him we said hello. I will, I will. Tom, great to see you. Okay, thanks for Take having me. Tom Brads, great thought leader, uh, really around category killers, category creators, being innovative and different, that's the key to success. Thanks for sharing. This is theCUBE Conversations here at Palo Alto. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching.